Coming up on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll explain some of the factors that go into determining consumer demand for beef. We'll share some valuable tips on how you can get your calves off to a strong, healthy start. Plus, we'll talk about some valuable educational programs from NCBA that can make a positive impact on your operation. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. First, this important update from NCBA CEO Colin Woodall in Denver. The COVID-19 coronavirus crisis is a top priority for NCBA. In fact, we have kept our offices in both Denver and Washington, D.C. open in order to make sure that we are doing everything we can to protect our members, the cattle producers across this country. And that is by far the highest priority for us, making sure that beef continues to flow through the supply chain so that way we have a market for our cattle. And we are also doing everything we can to remind consumers that there is not a shortage of beef. And yes, while the meat cases may very well be empty when you get to the grocery store, there is more coming. So instead of uh, taking 47 ribeyes with you, just take what you need because there is more on its way. And I think if we can introduce a little bit more confidence into the consumer that uh, they're going to be able to find ground beef and steaks when they go to the uh, grocery store, then I do believe that will help us in this overall uh, response. But the fact that we continue to see the meat cases cleaned out is a great sign of the support that we have from our consumers. And what's even more interesting is all of the photographs that we have seen from grocery stores across the country where the meat case has been cleaned out. There's not a steak or a package of ground beef to be found, but yet we still see the fake meat case fully stocked. Uh, not a whole lot of people are looking to buy Beyond Burgers right now. And I think as cattle producers, we need to take that as a great shot in the arm that we still are the preferred protein. And also, I think it shows a very clear signal that even in a time of crisis, uh, most consumers do not want that product. Uh, very telling from our perspective. We also continue to work with the packers to make sure that they are maintaining the packing plants, keeping them open, and also encouraging them to look at the true market right now to make sure that they are paying competitive bids for cattle. We need to make sure that we keep everybody in the beef supply chain healthy, and that means that we need to make sure that feeders, stockers, cow-calf producers are being able to, uh, to share in this great demand that we are seeing in this time of crisis. We're also having direct conversations with all levels of the government. We're working with Congress right now on their efforts to put in place additional relief to make sure that cattle producers are a part of those relief packages. We've worked with USDA to ensure that they're going to keep USDA inspectors and graders on the job, because if we don't have those graders and inspectors in the plants, then we're not going to be able to operate those plants. And so far, they have been fully committed to help us. We have worked with the Department of Transportation to get a waiver on hours of service to ensure that we can move as much product as possible. And we've also asked the Commodity Futures Trading Commission to look at the dysfunction in the futures markets right now. The futures markets are not reflective of the true demand picture out there, and we want to make sure that CFTC is uh, monitoring that and looking at uh, any issues that are popping up. And we do believe that there is a lot of concern there that is impacting the overall market. Uh, we are working directly with the White House, making sure that they are aware of our needs and the overall situation. But the bottom line is uh, we are on the job. We are working to protect our, our members, the cattle producers of this country, and also make sure that we uh, just reassure the consumer that uh, our great tasting, nutritious, high quality beef is going to be there for them. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Auctioner. As the voice of the cattle industry in our nation's capital, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association fights for producers in Congress, in the courts, and at the White House. NCBA staff in Washington focus on the issues that could impact the beef industry, so members are free to take care of business back at home. We recently asked cattlemen and women from around the country what message they would like to send to Washington, D.C. We take care of our cattle, we take care of our land, we take care of our communities, our schools, and I think that, you know, let us do what we do, but 
protect us so you know we don't get these encroachments from all the the things that come down to us so i think as we you know let us we don't really want a handout we want fair markets and we want to be able to sell our product you know in this country as well as worldwide that we exist out here and uh, sometimes that we living in flyover country we get um, kind of ignored sometimes and that uh, agriculture is very important it's a ripple effect to every economy and uh, just to make sure that they uh, pay attention to what we're doing and that we're worth listening to allow us to continue our business uh, don't restrict us and, and and let the free market really work work its magic you might say uh, I, I think that's that that is a challenge in our environment anymore is that there's a there's a lot of facets within our in the United States that rely on government to, to take care of them and, and maintain their lifestyles and and that's a challenge in agriculture and, and on the animal side of things you know we I think the majority of us still want to let the free market dictate how how we can do business uh, let us do our business and uh stay with the regulations we have. We don't need any more regulations. You know, I think that, the again, the fake meat thing, um, that's, that's a huge deal that kind of starts, you know, touching into our stomping grounds or stomping all over our stomping grounds. And um, I think that that's a huge thing that um, we need to tackle and we need to make sure there's a clear line between um, the 28 ingredients that's in the fake meat and the one ingredient that's in our our real meat. You know, Colin's been a, a good advocate for us and a good fighter, um, and uh, we just got to keep uh, keep forging forward and, and uh, representing our interests. And, and for the guys that are up the ladder, um, just realize that uh, we're out to feed the world. And uh, on top of that, we're we're doing it in the using the best practices possible um, for humane treatment, being stewards of the land. Um, I want everybody to recognize that because when it comes down to it, we have an increasing population and uh, we got to meet the demands. NCBA staff in Washington, D.C. work every day on a number of policy issues that could impact the beef industry. Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll talk about NCBA's producer education program and the opportunities it offers cattle producers. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Are you concerned about the impact government policies could have on your cattle business? One way to make your voice heard in Washington is by joining NCBA. When you join, you'll have access to key policy updates and insights from Beltway Beef. It's the best way to hear directly from NCBA's DC team. Beltway Beef provides valuable policy information and it's free for NCBA members. Stay in touch with Beltway Beef. Join now at ncba.org. The only thing tougher than your hands is your backbone. And if you make a living doing this, you've got the toughest one there is. It's how you stand so tall, and we'll stand right behind you with the innovation, passion, and integrity that drives us to do what's right for your operation, for your future, for you. This is why Merck Animal Health works. NCBA takes great pride in being a premier source of education to help producers manage the daily challenges they face. Joining us now is Josh White, NCBA's Executive Director of Producer Education. Josh, start out by telling us why NCBA has a producer education program and exactly what does your department do? Sure. Well, you know, it's all about supporting producers and, and uh, adding value to their NCBA membership and really adding value to the industry, our state affiliates and partners. Um, we're very collaborative. A lot of what we do is involves our state affiliates, our breed affiliates, whether it's helping them with grant dollars, helping them plan events and functions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of our key programs is the Beef Quality Assurance Program, which is checkoff funded, but also has uh, involves BQA state coordinators and trainers all around the country. So nearly everything we do involves tying back to those state and breed affiliates or partners like the BQA coordinators around the country. Where we do have some, uh, you know, highlight events that we put on, such mm -hmm. as our webinar series that we do with collaborating speakers uh, there. We also have, of course, Cattlemen's College and other programs that 
that we run primarily, but again, it's all about bringing the best content, the best education, adding value uh, for members, making their life a little better, uh, helping their operation be more profitable. One of the real practical courses you offer, of course, is the Stockmanship and Stewardship Program. Tell us more about that and the benefits that provides. Yeah, that program has a pretty long history now, um, but we a few years ago expanded it, added a, a highlight sponsor. Merck Animal Health is our big sponsor of that. BQA also puts in a sponsorship and NCBA uh, of working together again, collaborating to deliver um, unique programs around the country for those big highlight events. We do five a year. Um, we're excited this year to be going to some new locations. We'll be in Nevada, uh, I think in late summer, early fall, as well as Indiana, some places we haven't been, but essentially on uh, hands-on training um, for stockmanship, but also each of those events is tailored to that area of the country. You know, what are the issues facing those producers, you know, at that time of year? Um, could be genetics, could be soils and forages, could be, um, you know, more animal health mm -hmm. focus, but always includes an opportunity to be BQA certified right in person and always include some animal handling uh, demonstrations. And speaking of BQA, you've recently launched some new modules online, and I understand there's a new certification program maybe coming? Well, it's, it's the same process we've had with certification, just a new set of modules, new look and feel, okay. very much more realistic, so more um, you know, short videos, and if you went through the previous version, they were a little you know, cartoon-based, uh, more graphic-based, so um, you know, we really like this more realistic, a little more gritty feel to it. Right. We think producers will really appreciate it. Um, and so, again, if you haven't been certified in the last three years, you need to go re-up, do that again, and okay. we hope it's a great experience for you. We love to hear everyone's feedback, and that's what helped us shape this version. An easy way to do it, obviously, in the comfort of your own home, right? Right. If you don't make it to one of those stockmanship and stewardship events or an online or an in-person training in your state, then check it out online. Now we recently completed uh, Cattlemen's College at the NCBA convention or the uh, Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA trade show and the opening session the topic was all about sustainability. Why is such, that such an important issue to you and to NCBA at large? Yeah I think sustainability was a big theme um, that I don't know was necessarily planned so much but uh, you know Randy Block at Cattle Facts really hit on it hard uh, at their update and our new president, uh, you know, highlighted it, as well as uh, uh, Purdue in his, you know, our ag commissioner in his secretary of ag in his um, comments to the to the crowd. So, you know, sustainability has been a bit of a buzzword for a while, but it's mm -hmm. it's obviously not going away. We just see more and more, uh, whether it's companies, whether it's uh, you know from the corporate side or from from just hands-on training that that students are getting in universities. It's mm -hmm. becoming really integrated into our. Uh, how you know how we raise food and so you know I think it's just really about embracing um, all of the tools we can to be more efficient mm -hmm. and more profitable and that leads to a great sustainability outcome um, the keynote specifically we had Tryon Wickersham mm -hmm. from Texas A&M a, a fantastic researcher that's mm -hmm. um, you know really has a nutrition background yeah. working on upcycling yeah. and uh, you know the marvel of cattle production or even small ruminants is their ability to upcycle. That's the that's the magic of the rumen, right? Yeah. The miracle of the rumen. And so really highlighting that, turning that science into a positive message about sustainability. And then, um, you know, we also heard from Dr. Wayne Morgan, who leads sustainability and some other areas for Golden State Foods, which sure. is a huge food manufacturer, including, um, you know, hamburger patties for McDonald's, but they also do a lot of other things, including condiments and everything. And just explaining, you know, what they've done to improve their sustainability as an organization and an operation at Golden State and also their expectations of the supply chain. Yeah, that's outstanding. Now, you mentioned earlier in our conversation that uh, you all have webinars that are open for all producers. Tell us a little more about that. Yeah, we've been doing the Cattlemen's webinar series for almost five years now. So there's a great library. If you go to the producer tab at ncba.org, those are free and available. The recordings are there from past webinars. Uh, we're in the middle of, a, of one on soils and forages, grazing management right now. We're doing five webinars throughout the month of March, one every week with great speakers from around the country, including, including producers, so past environmental stewardship award winners and others that are doing a great job being innovative on their farms and ranches with grazing. So would encourage you to check those out. and. Uh, 
recently completed one with uh, on new genetic uh, selection tools that are available with the eBeef team, mm -hmm. some terrific uh, researchers and extension geneticists. So we're always looking for hot topics in the industry that we can cover mm -hmm. um, and offer those uh, free. And so well, check them out. Yeah. Thank you so much for continuing to bring us resources that allow us to sharpen our axe. We'll try to add value every day. Appreciate that, Josh. Thanks, Kevin. Now, to find out more about the programs Josh talked about and all the education information available to beef producers, visit ncba.org and click on the Producers tab at the top. We're not done talking about sustainability. When we come back, we'll take a look at the impact it's having from the ranch gate to the beef consumer's plate. Stay with us. We didn't just design the 6M tractors with you in mind. We designed them with you by our side. The new 6M tractors from John Deere. Reimagined by you, for you. With improved visibility, better maneuverability, and more ways to customize. So you get everything you need and nothing you don't. Experience the new 6M at your local John Deere dealer. How's your production on pasture? Our profits down, our weight gains down. What are you going to do about it? Do something cost effective. Do something that will make a difference. To add the first and proven leader in feed through horn fly control to your cattle rations, ask for it by name, Altacid IGR. Join the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. NCBA is the oldest cattle industry organization, working every day to defend your interests in Washington, D.C. And there are big benefits to being a member. You'll get news you can use in the National Cattlemen and policy updates from Beltway Beef. Plus big discounts from John Deere, Cabela's, and more great partners. Join now. Call 866-233-3872 or sign up online at ncba.org. Sustainability is an issue in nearly every business, including the beef industry. And the impact stretches from the pasture all the way to the consumer. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brad Bulla examines how the issue of sustainability is impacting the beef value chain. Within the beef cattle industry, there's a lot of talk, concern, and some confusion about sustainability. The experts say, like it or not, sustainability is an issue that's here to stay. We can wish all we want that it would go away, and I think one of the things producers really need to keep in mind is we've really been emphasizing sustainability since the beginning of the beef cattle industry and trying to exist and remain resilient through a lot of challenges. The beef industry is a continuum, starting with the beef producer, going to the feed yards, going to the packer, to the, us, the processors, and then on to the uh, retail brands that take the products out to the consumers. And at every step of the way, we need success, and we need people to be concentrated on doing the right things for the animals, for the environment, and for our society. Recently, at a Cattlemen's College session in San Antonio, doctors Wickersham and Morgan outlined some of the progress cattle producers and the beef industry have made in addressing sustainability. They stressed to the audience that consumers crave information about these efforts. The fact is our consumers, the people who are buying our products, they're asking questions. They want to know what we are doing, they want to know how we're doing things, and they expect that we're doing the right things, but they want us to demonstrate it. They want to see it. But with all this information, there's a lot of mis information. And the cattle producers have uh, become victim of a lot of misinformation and, and uh, misguided notions about what we're doing and what, what is being done in, in the, out on the countryside. And so we need to take all these avenues that are available to tell the great story of beef production in the U.S. Any time there's a vacuum in terms of information, someone will try and fill that information. And so it works best if we go ahead and fill that vacuum with information that's true about the beef cattle industry, how we use technology, how we use different feeds, and address those concerns consumers might have and tell our own sustainability story, rather than allowing someone else to tell it for us. 
When discussing sustainability, one of the strong points for the beef industry is the fact that cattle are great upcyclers. That means cows eat the grass and other byproducts that people cannot eat and then convert those into high quality protein in the form of beef. So what we talked about this morning was um, protein upcycling and the ability of beef cattle and the beef cattle production systems to take low quality sources of biomass, so forages, byproducts, co-products from other industries, and basically convert those into high quality beef that consumers enjoy consuming. Talking about protein upcycling gives them a positive story and maybe gives them a different way of explaining what everybody knows beef cattle do in harvesting forage, harvesting biomass, and then using that um, as a source of protein and a tasty source of protein that humans actually want to and desire to consume. From the cow-calf producer to the feedlot and beyond, the issue of sustainability is making an impact on all segments of the beef industry. And these experts say producers need to do what they can to reach consumers with the facts about beef sustainability. Beef cattle production actually has a really good story to tell to consumers. Um, we've just not been proactive enough in telling that story. And so anytime there's an opportunity or questions about your operation, what you're doing, um, whether that's from a neighbor or and just consumers in general, really take that opportunity to address the questions they have and talk about what you do and why you do those things. We have a great product. We have a product that people want and people need, whether they know it or not. And we just need to tell that great story so that they can embrace this product and feel good about it. From Cattlemen's College in San Antonio, I'm Brad Buller reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Now, if you'd like to keep up to date on this important topic, you can get valuable information on sustainability and how it's impacting the beef cattle industry by visiting the website beefresearch.org. Still ahead on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll explain some of the factors that go into determining consumer demand for beef. Stay with us. We'll be right back. When it comes to the beef business, there's no room for gray area. The decisions being made in Washington affect the future of the beef industry, the livelihood of your fellow farmers and ranchers. Your National Cattlemen's Beef Association knows there's what benefits cattlemen and there's what doesn't. To us, it's as clear as black and white. Visit joinncba.org to learn more. At Case IH, we believe it's our job to provide you with solutions. That's why our Farmall and Maxim tractors, as well as our tools and attachments, are designed with you in mind. From mowing to baling to loading and more, we're here to help turn your to-dos into to-dones. At Case IH, we'll keep your days running smoothly with equipment that's durable, versatile, and highly efficient. No wonder farmers are more loyal to Case IH than any other brand. Visit your local dealer or go to caseih.com forward slash livestock for more. And with me now is Jojo Corrales with Heart Brand Beef. Jojo, thanks for giving us a few minutes today. Absolutely, pleasure to be here. Let's talk about the beef business for a minute. I, I'm interested, um, what are some of the key trends that are shaping our industry as you look out over the next 10 or so years? Yeah, I think the future is bright for the beef industry and, and we're really excited kind of of the trends that we've seen. So as you look over the past 10, 20 years uh, and you look at where uh, the customer is, is leading us, mm -hmm. uh, I really feel uh, our beef customer is asking for more information. They're becoming more educated. They wanna know where their beef came from how it was raised, what region it came from. And in our specific experience, they want to know what breed it is. Yeah. So I, I think as that customer goes to this grocery store and to the, to the restaurants, uh, they want to have choices more than anything. And yeah. I think we realize as beef producers, we have the best animal protein there is, and we're proud of that. But if our customers will tell us where our opportunity is, it's making beef more consistently better. Mm. So we're in the marbling breed, uh, and we, we want to give that that good, uh, wholesome uh, flavor and tenderness and juiciness to it, but we have to do it consistently, I think, to have to have future. And I think in the next tick, yeah, 10 years, uh, I think the branded beef program is not going away. I think the, the customers are going to want more options, uh, and I think that that'll have a, a long, long stay here. Clearly, there's a huge proliferation of branded beef programs, and Heart Brand is one of them. I'm curious, as you survey the landscape of uh, branded beef programs, particularly highly marbled branded beef, what do you see out there? 
Well, I, I think the Akaushi genetics uh, have been used many different ways within branded programs. So Heart Brand, we use uh, the Akaushi exclusively in okay. our in our program. They must be DNA verified through the Breed Association. In our program, we allow 50% and above to come into our Beef Alliance. Uh, we're a natural fed program, no implant ever, okay. uh, fed naturally. Uh, and that, that's something that gives us a product that's very marketable. Okay. So uh, we, we have uh, that percent uh, prime and choice that, that we feel fits our clientele and we've, we've had a, a good success being able to sell it. Yeah, and as you think about uh, the Akiushi cattle specifically, were you telling me that you've collected 50,000 carcass data points on these cattle? Yeah, that's extremely exciting. That's so, I mean, th this is a day of data. Uh, so, I, I feel that when you look at the Akushi Association yeah. and what Heartbrand's records have, have shown uh, within the har cattle we've harvested, over the last 50,000 head of cattle, we've had less than 3% select and no roll. Yeah. And those are a lot of half-blood cattle. Right. So, these are USDA graded, uh, and we've averaged 47% prime, <laughs> uh, and with only 3% being uh, you know, non-compliant for our beef. And, and that's what it's all about is making our customer a better product and we know that higher marbled beef gives them a better eating experience. No doubt marbling and quality is important but uh, I know the folks I talk to they don't want to sacrifice gain and weight and so I'm curious as you've selected more for gain and some feed efficiency, what have you seen happen from a quality grading perspective? Yeah, so when I was introduced to the Akushi cattle over 15 years ago, when I first saw them, I thought they, they had a niche that was so unique to be able to apply marbling, yet have a functional body type. Okay. So uh, I think when we first started in 2009 uh, and our cattle team being able to look at trying to have a bull that a commercial buyer would be accepting of, I agree with you, marbling is important, uh, carcass and tenderness are important, but if you can't get their efficiency, right. you, you really haven't gained any ground. So as we've increased gain, muscle, body type, uh, and especially maintaining those traits like fertility and feet and legs, uh, our marbling has not taken a step back. Really? That's something that we've really had to keep an eye on in the ownership of our brand, make sure that we do not give up the trait that brought us to the table. Uh, in fact, in 2018, our percent prime has actually been about 8-10% higher than, than our last 50,000 head killed. That's an incredible testimony. So I'm curious, you mentioned commercial cattlemen. Uh, when commercial cattlemen come to buy a bull, what are they looking for? Yeah, so, so we sell our bulls uh, for commercial prices, five to $10,000 uh, is where most of our bulls are sold. Okay. And they're wanting a bull to go out usually on their own commercial cattle okay. uh, that, that are adapted to their environment. Sure. Uh, we don't tell them what season they need to calve in, uh, exact brand of vaccine. Usually these are the guys, Kevin, that are already progressive. They're all are already doing all these things that, that are uh, making better animals, and we're just introducing a higher marbled breed on top of that. And what they're looking for is to not give up weaning weight, right. and they're wanting to be able to market those calves easier. So the Heart Brand Buyback Program has allowed them to increase their amount of income with maintaining everything the same except changing the bull they use. So on finished fed cattle, we offer 20 to 25 cents over the live market for Akushi half-blood natural fed cattle. And on wean calves, uh, that premium will usually range uh, between 100 to 150 dollars is what they should expect. So we'd love to have those Akushi calves back. Sure. I mean, that's what we're in the business of doing is yeah. selling beef, uh, but it's strictly their option. It's not mandatory to sell back. Uh, and if they have a better outlet for them, they're, they're more than welcome to it. That's incredible. And in these kind of economic times that we've been dealing with over the last couple of years, uh, every 100, 150 dollars really counts in the cattle business. Without a doubt. Thank you so much for coming and sharing this perspective with us, Jojo. Absolutely, enjoyed it. You bet. Yes, sir. And if you'd like to learn more, please go to heartbrandbeef.com. As beef producers, we know demand for beef, both in the United States and overseas, is an important part of what drives market prices for our cattle. However, beef demand is actually a more complex topic than you may think. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Russell Nemitz has a closer look at the factors that go into determining beef demand. 
Well, each year here at the Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show, one of the biggest topics up for discussion are the cattle markets. And with us on today's segment to help us answer that question and where we're headed with beef demand and the cattle market outlook for 2020 and beyond is Oklahoma State University's economist, Dr. Daryl Peel. And you were one of the presenters here at this year's Zoetis Cattlemen's College. And Dr. Peel, talk about beef demand first and what 2020 looks like there. Well, in terms of our presentation this time, it's a really interesting project. It's really reporting some research that we've done in the last year or so at Oklahoma State. It really uh, acknowledges the fact that beef demand is very complex. Uh, we don't market one thing. We call it beef demand, but it's really thousands of different products. And so this session goes into what we've learned in interviewing lots of industry people about uh, literally the thousands of different products, how they interact with each other, and how that all supports our demand, particularly in light of things like growing international uh, trade and, and those kind of things. You know, let's talk a little bit about that a little bit more, Dr. Peel, because it seems to me that consumer demand, whether we're young or old, for this high quality protein we call beef continues to rise. It really has, and if you look over the last five years or so in this cyclical expansion we've been in, uh, you know, we've added uh, significantly to cattle numbers. We've added about 15% to total beef supplies, beef production in the U.S. since the low in 2015, and yet we've maintained uh, strong prices, and all of that's a testament to the fact that the demand has been very good, both in the domestic market as well as in the international market. You know, so as we talk about those hardworking cattlemen and cattle women across this great country of ours who are raising this high quality protein beef. Uh, what's your outlook for the market here in 2020 and beyond, especially on the heels of the most recent USDA cattle inventory report? Well, that's right. We just got the newest numbers. It confirmed that we actually peaked in this cyclical expansion in 2019. So we're a little bit smaller, really more of a sideways or a plateau uh, in terms of cattle numbers. But what that means is that we will not be adding as much supply pressure. Beef production will probably reach just slightly higher in 2020 for another new record, uh, but not a, a big increase. So supply pressure is, is kind of holding steady. And so again, all eyes are kind of on demand in terms of what that means for prices. The bottom line from a cattle perspective, you work it back down through the system, is that we expect, uh, you know, some, some good support for cattle and, and modestly higher prices in 2020, particularly in the second half of the year. Dr. Peel, while we have you, maybe explain to cattle producers why it's important for them to know and better understand beef demand as a whole. You know, all value in this industry, like any industry, comes from final demand. So, um, you know, the, the ability uh, to understand cattle prices at any level uh, comes from understanding the final consumers of these products. And, and, of course, the beef industry gets tricky because we take that one animal apart into literally thousands of different products. So we, it's a complicated process to understand how that value all comes together. But it is truly important. If we don't have demand, uh, we don't have a, an industry. Uh, I used to teach students in class, if you don't have demand for what you do, uh, it's just a hobby, it's not a business. So demand is the key. Perfect, that's a great way to end the segment. Again, we appreciate you taking a little bit of time for us here on Cattlemen to Cattlemen. My pleasure, always. All right, Kevin, without a question, some very good news for cattlemen and cattle women across this great country of ours from Oklahoma State University's ag economist, Dr. Daryl Peel. With that, we'll go ahead and send it back to you. If you'd like to learn more about what's happening with NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, you can find us on Facebook. Be sure to like our page and we'll keep you updated with photos, details on upcoming shows, and much more. And it's a great way to connect with other cattlemen and women all across the country. So check us out on Facebook. Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll share some valuable tips on how you can get your calves off to a strong, healthy start. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Grass is the center of our universe. So everything revolves around that. We've got to have a grass program that we can count on and plan on. What we need is an effective herbicide that can kill the weeds. That's what we need to sustain us, to keep us growing, to keep us prospering. We grow our own cows. We like selling them, not buying them. 
I'm Tommy Brandenberger, and along with my wife, we're Cow-Calf Producers. If you're connected with the beef cattle business, then you should like the NCBA page on Facebook. The NCBA Facebook page shares photos, news, and valuable information about the beef cattle industry. You can also follow the NCBA Twitter feed at BeefUSA. So stay in touch with NCBA on Facebook and Twitter. Cattle producers know not only do sick calves represent lost productivity and increased labor, the financial impact can be devastating. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter takes us to Oklahoma to see how new options in intranasal vaccines can help producers improve the health and performance of their calves and add to their bottom line. In eastern Oklahoma, Colby Cunningham and his family are carrying on a ranching tradition that began more than 100 years ago. Just four years ago, Colby added this land to his part of the operation and started running cows and calves here. We've carved a, a ranch, I guess you should say. Um, as far as you can see, it uh, was all timber, uh, not big timber, but timber that you couldn't, you couldn't go horseback through, you couldn't walk through. Nothing. So we've came in and dozed it, uh, leveled it, uh, seeded it in some areas, cool season and warm season to get it capable of running a cow. The main thing I look for is when uh, cattle get up, I look for a stretch. Um, a sick animal never stretches. Uh, I love to walk through the babies and every time a baby gets up and stretches, uh, it means he feels good. After they're weaned, Colby's calves head down the road to the family's grow yard, but in 2018, he ran into a significant respiratory disease problem with his calf crop. Two years ago, we weaned, um, took them back to the grow yard. At about 18 days, we ended up pulling 40% of these home race calves. 40% pulls and a 1% death loss on a home race calf. And I was very frustrated. Home race cattle should not be like that. They haven't been anywhere. At that point, Colby knew he needed some help, so he consulted with the team from Merck Animal Health about options to add intranasal vaccines to his herd health program. We jump into the following calf crop. We decide to add the intranasal program and to add branding, um, which the calves average two to three months old. That was the only thing I changed in my protocol. This year we closed out 0% death loss and 1% pulls, which is a huge difference. He incorporated internasal vaccination into his program. Uh, he did it after some frustration with the amount of cattle that he'd treated the year before the, and, and some death loss. Uh, in cattle that had been well vaccinated, that he didn't feel like he should have that issue. So as he incorporated internasal the next year, uh, he saw a dramatic decrease. I mean, he treated very few cattle. He didn't lose any cattle. To me, I'm a, I'm a big data person. Uh, everybody can say what they want to say. They've done this, they've done that. But I have visually seen the difference uh, between the two years versus internasal, uh, no internasal. Just the, the difference between pulls and retreats uh, feed conversions, I mean, the list goes on and on. But the addition of an internasal at a, that young age may have been what was really setting these calves up to where when the preconditioned shots came into play and then these cattle moved into the grow yard uh, where they were going to be backgrounded for 45 days, they were better set up to handle that change and be ready to grow when they got there. I think the immunity response that, that we built from it as a baby um, through the internasal is extremely good. And I'm excited to keep using it year after year uh, at branding, and I think it's a great opportunity to, to give it as a baby. Dr. Park says new options in intranasal vaccines do provide producers with the ability to protect their calves at a younger age. Nasalgen 3 is a, it's a product that we just received approval on. It's a product that's been in the works for a long time. Now we've created an opportunity to address calves at a younger age. So many times we're, when it comes to the management of those animals, we're stuck with what the producer can do and we're stuck with what environment will let us do. So it creates an opportunity, a bigger window for us to stimulate good immunity in these animals. 
along with another product that we have, once PMHIN, which is a Mannheimia pastorella product that we can put in our nasal. Now we've got two products that fit very well when we start thinking about neonatal respiratory disease, disease that we may see on grass, uh, especially in these spring calves, or that we may see in that fall time frame on some of our fall calving herds. If we can stimulate immunity in those young calves when we're talking about branding, or even in some of our stalker animals that may be coming in, if we can stimulate a rapid immune system at the point of entry of a lot of these bugs, we can set these animals up to succeed as they, as they continue in that process. And Dr. Park says the way intranasal vaccines are administered creates a less stressful experience for the animal. Intranasal vaccines, uh, as we look at products like Nasalgen 3 or, or once PMH IN, what they do is they create in, in a setting where animal welfare has come to the surface and we're focused on animal welfare, BQA is a huge, huge issue. So anything that we can do to reduce the number of needles we put in the animal, increase the quality of beef that we're producing is gonna help us. So there's no needle, it can be with a cannula that goes in the nose or it can be with a gun that may create a mist. So there's various opportunities as far as delivering the product. So yep, we're leaving the needle out, we put it in the mucosal surface, and let the immune system go to work. Dr. Parks adds that working closely with your veterinarian is key to creating a successful herd health program and keeping up to date with vaccine options that can make an impact on your bottom line. We like to think that if we precondition cattle, the benefit may be at farm level as we wean these animals, we get growth, we have healthy animals, they, they just perform better for us. So that's part of it as well. It's not just price per hundred as much as it is, what is the total dollar? We're selling pounds. It boils down to we sell pounds in this business. I feel like um, the vaccination program is, is very important and, and we're doing it to make money. Uh, well, I, I'm doing it to make money and uh, uh, healthy cattle make more money any day of the week. On the Cunningham Ranch in eastern Oklahoma, I'm Brian Baxter reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. If you'd like to learn more about intranasal vaccines and how they can add value to your herd health program, visit the website nasalgen.com. When we return, we'll check in with our good friend, Baxter Black. Stay with us. It started with a man, a plot of land, and a few head of cattle. That man, your great-grandfather. You've got his name and his legacy too. It's what you fight to live up to and work to leave behind. With innovation, integrity, and passion that runs as deep as yours, we'll be there for your operation, for your future, for you. This is why Merck Animal Health works. Did you know that Prefort makes over a thousand different farm, ranch, and rodeo items? And now, thanks to Prefort Direct, it's easier than ever before to get access to every item Prefort makes delivered direct to your local dealer. For more information about Prefort Direct, visit us at prefort.com. Prefort, America's number one name in farm, ranch, and rodeo. Colorado Satellite, highest quality, reasonable price. Well, that about says it. In business since 1945, a family operation who make, sell, ride, and take pride in what they put on a horse. A wide choice for ranchers, cowboys, outfitters, barrel racers, cutters, rainers, and light ones for trail riders. And cowboy poets, of course. I've been riding mine for 20 years. 303-572-8350. Shipping's free on new saddles. ColoradoSaddlery.com. Dave came by. I'd seen him at the horse sale last week. Did you sell that horse you were on? What was his name? Dumbo, he said. Dumbest horse I've ever rode. I got him from a forest ranger. She gave him to me as a gift, but he is dumb. I mean, I'm riding two three-year-olds right now, and it took me less than 20 minutes to train them to open a gate. Side pass from the right on one side, through the gate, side pass on the left, the other side, and close it. Simple, but not for him. I spent two hours pushing, prodding, leaning, leading, reaching, and trying to get Dumbo into position. He reacted like him and the gate post were opposing magnets. So I dropped a loop. 
over the post, took a little dally around the horn, and tried to pull us, and the closest I could get was three and a half feet at a 45 degree angle. In the round pen, I attempted to familiarize him with a rope. You'd have thought it was live electrical wire. I started uncoiling and he was snorting and blowing and prancing and, you know, I've never been on a lepizoner before, but now I know how it feels. I made a loop and accidentally hit him on the rump with the tip. In his exuberance to escape, he tripped over himself, fell against the rails and dumped me out over the shoulder. I've still never roped an animal from his back. He rains better when I hold a fishing pole over his head and dangle an ear of corn. Well, that's tolerable on a big gather, but pretty unhandy when you're in the sorting alley. That and the fact that he's scared of cows. Oh, and he's never been shot. He'd hold for a minute for the trimming, but he couldn't abide the hammer. Well, I finally got the dumb bugger shod <clears throat> in the horizontal position. Well, I asked Dave what he brought at the sale. Two hundred dollars, he said. Well, surely, I said, he must have had some good points. Yeah, said Dave. For one, he was easy to catch. But then you had to ask yourself, what's the point? This is Baxter Black. And this is not Dumbo, by the way, from out there. What does it mean to be an American cattleman? It means you have what it takes where it counts, on the inside. At Ritchie, we understand that. It's what's on the inside that defines us. We share the same values, ingenuity, commitment, sense of pride. These are the values that built this country. They're the values that built this company. Ritchie, proud to be a partner to the American cattleman since 1921. Well, with us on today's program is Robert Edmondson from Ritchie Industries. And Robert, we're going to talk about the significance of some of your new products here at Ritchie Industries. But first, I want you to describe for folks at home the importance of livestock operations, not only to have a clean water supply for their animals, but also a reliable water supply. Sure. Yes, a clean water supply is very uh, beneficial to the, the end user because it, uh, it helps you know, it's nutrition for the animals. It uh, it's, uh, saves them. It'll save them money in the long run if they have clean, fresh water to drink. Uh, animals are less tendency to get sick. Um, then, uh, for a fresh water supply, you know, a clean fresh water something that's easy to clean, uh, fresh clean water all the time is, is very beneficial to them. Well, you guys have been around for quite some time. Let's talk about this new water that is right in front of us, uh, the Genesis, and I guess what prompted the need for this new Ritchie Industries water? Sure. A couple years ago, we came out with a, line, a new line of water. It's called the Genesis. Uh, this one here actually came out in October of, of uh, 19. Um, the, the, the need for the line of waters was uh, it's something that's easy for the, a farmer to get into. Um, so if they are currently on a stock tank or a concrete water or something like that, and they want to step up into a more of an automatic type of water system, this is a, a, a good option for them. It's easy to install. You don't have to put it on. You don't have to mount it down. You can, it can be portable, uh, or, you, or you have the option of mounting it down and having a permanent location for it. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. What sets this, this new model kind of apart from some of your uh, traditional Ritchie waters? Well, the traditional ones, you, uh, they're, they're not designed to be portable. You can't move them around, so they have to be bolted down. Where this one's a little different. It's lightweight. It's, uh, it's easy to move. It come, you can get an attachment to it to hook it up to a garden hose if you wanted to. So if you're looking for something that, that you want to be portable with, this is a, a good option for you. Now this particular one, the Genesis line, is a, is a non-insulated unit. So it's different than all of our other units because of that. Um, it's really designed for like a portable installation. Uh, it's designed for the southern states. 
um, where they don't really need all that heavy insulation that we do in our other units. Um, this unit also has the elliptical balls that float in on top, uh, which helps prevent uh, evaporation during the summer, uh, cuts down on algae growth. So it's a pretty good model for the southern states and that type of area. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as we kind of wind things up here, Robert, is there a particular animal species like this particular Ritchie water works better for than maybe some of your other Ritchie products? Well, this one was designed for cattle, but it can be used for anything, um, you know, goats, sheep, um, on up from there. So it's not really designed for a specific animal, but uh, it'll, it'll handle just about all of them. Well, we appreciate you taking a little time for us here on uh, Cattlemen to Cattlemen to describe all the new models along with some of their traditional waters at Ritchie Industries. Of course, in the meantime, you can always find out more information about Ritchie Industries and their products by visiting them online at RitchieFont.com. We're wrapping up this episode of Cattlemen to Cattlemen by sharing some photos of NCBA staff and cattle producers from around the country advocating on Capitol Hill. Take a look. Are you looking for a great podcast that focuses strictly on the beef industry? Then check out NCBA's Cattleman's Call, hosted by Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Lane Nordland. Each month, Lane takes an inside look at some of the issues cattle producers are facing while sharing the stories of their lives and businesses. You can listen to Cattleman's Call on your phone, tablet, or laptop by subscribing through your favorite podcast app or going to ncba.org and clicking on the news link. Well, that wraps up this edition of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. Thanks so much for spending time with us. We'll see you again next week right here on RFD TV.